Hello and welcome to Heal Thyself, Benefits of Holistic Living. I'm Mia Signs, your host, and with me in this segment is Mary O'Malley. And the title of this show is, What's in the Way is the Way. That's also the title of her book. So welcome, Mary. Oh, welcome, Mia. So glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here. So can you share a little bit about yourself with us? And then we're going to get into your work and your book and, and all that. Well, I had one of those childhoods you wouldn't wish on anybody. Mm -hmm. And they say pretty much so that your view of yourself and of the world is formed by the time you're six. And we kind of absorb it from, you know, the people around us. And I love to say most of us were raised by unconscious giants that we thought were gods. Mm -hmm. And so what I say in this book is we all take on these core spells And I love the word spells because the spell is something that's laid over the top of you. It's not true and it can be lifted. And I think I took on every single core spell that that a human being could. And I went down and down and down until uh, when I was 23, I gained 97 pounds in a year. I washed most of that food down with alcohol and took every single drug I could get my hands on. And, um, and then when that didn't work, when that didn't numb the pain that I didn't know how to be with from how I was handled when I was young, I tried to kill myself three times in the next year. Mm-hmm. And I was, the last time I slit my wrists, and I, it's such a, poignant moment, I can remember the depth of the Mm self-hate, that I was even a failure at suicide. And I asked my first really open-ended question. I didn't realize this till later, years later. I said, if I can't get out of this, what is this whole thing about? And about a year later, a very uh, interesting, wonderful man who taught Hatha Yoga, but also taught yana yoga. And I went to a weekend workshop. He was up from California. And all of a sudden, it was like I had stepped out of a B-grade, black and white, grainy horror movie into a Dolby surround sound, Technicolor, Panavision movie. And I couldn't tell you what I was hearing there. I would go out of it and I would just, it would be like water through sand. So the third time he came up, I transcribed, I recorded and transcribed every single thing he said for the weekend. And then when my house and store burned to the ground, I lost that book. That was the thing I grieved the most. Mm -hmm. And I went to him and I said, you have lost this book. I want to tell you what I think the core of what you are offering. And he said, yes. I said, in the seeing is the movement. And he said, yes, Mm -hmm. that I realized through him that I had been trying to fix myself my whole life, Mm -hmm. that I felt there was something wrong with me. And at this core was this belief that I was bad and wrong and that fixing only got me into deeper shit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And he taught me in the seeing is the movement, in the ability to relate to what's going on. That's where the healing is. Oh, I'm so afraid. Oh, fear is here. Or, oh my God, I'm such a horrible person. Oh, the judger is here. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I met Stephen Levine, a wonderful man who wrote many books on death and dying, Mm -hmm. but really wrote books on how to be fully alive, that he taught me how to turn to myself with great tenderness and mercy. And that is when all of these parts came back into the hole that I am. That's awesome. We're going to cut right here. Mary, can you lower your camera a little bit? I'd love to see more of you. Okay. Um, Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes. Great. Okay, here we are back up. That's really lovely. Very, very lovely. Would you like to share with us um, your book that this is titled after? (laughs) Well, this is my fourth book. And uh, all of my books, uh, life has just taken me by the collar and said, okay, now it's time to write a book. 
you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, I sometimes go back and read my books and I realize, oh my God, you know, I didn't write this. <laughs> I made myself more of a scribe than an author. Yeah. And what's in the way is the way he started speaking to me, you know, uh, um, well, probably about three or four years ago. And I think the best way to describe this book is with the metaphor that I start the book with. Imagine a beautiful metaphor. Everything flows in that meadow. Light flows, sound flows, water flows, day flows into night, life into death, death into life. And we lived in that meadow when we were. Mm-hmm. We were the flow of life. And just watch a baby, you know, happiness, sadness, gladness, madness, you know, they just it just dances through them. There was nothing that we held on to. And then slowly and surely, we began to have thoughts in our head. Mm-hmm. And then slowly and surely, they coalesced into a self-image. I'm a boy. I'm a girl. My name is, you know. Mm-hmm. And the key word there is image. An image is not the real thing. Right. And all of us were wounded. We received these sacred wounds of invasion and abandonment when we were young. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have anybody there meeting us in those places because our parents had left themselves a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And so we pulled ourselves up and out of our bodies and got caught in our heads. So imagine all the clouds that pass around this across the sky, they begin to lower and they whirl and swirl around your head. Mm -hmm. That's what I call the cloud bank of struggle. Mm -hmm. And that's what most people think that they are. This cloud bank of struggle is made out of fear. It's glued together with judgment. And it always wants you in life to be different than what it is. Mm -hmm. The key to this metaphor is you've never left the meta. You just think you have. Mm -hmm. So this work is about learning how to thin the cloud banks. Not by fixing anything. Mm -hmm. Not by even changing yourself. It's by learning how to relate to all of this struggle in your head rather than from it so the cloud bank thins and you recognize yourself in the meadow again. And isn't that the most warming, joy-filled, peaceful connection to the divine feeling that we can have is that we didn't ever leave the meadow? It's always here, right now. Right now, I'm looking out this beautiful window. It's been raining. I have this weeping beech tree, and it's full of all these little drops of water. And and beyond it are these holly trees and these cedar trees. All of that is the expression of the love at the heart of life. That's what the meadow is made out of. Even science has shown the meadow is made out of light. Mm -hmm. But the quality of this light is love. And we are homesick to come home. We try to get home. We need to realize we already are home. Mm -hmm. And let us see with great tenderness these spells that we took on that separate us from the living moment from Mm -hmm. our home. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So share with us that we're not the storytellers in in our thinking. Mm-hmm. Alan Watts, the Zen philosopher, says this wonderful quote, no matter how many times you say the word water, it will never be wet. <laughs> now, we have been given this absolutely exquisite tool that took the universe billions of years to make it this frontal lobe as a tool for maneuvering through reality. But what has happened to us is most of us identify that we are these stories that pass through our head all day long. If the storyteller says, I'm sad, we think we're sad. If it says, I'm mad, we think we're mad. If it something happens, then all of a sudden, I can't tell you how many people, you know, the boss... Uh, uh, calls them out in a meeting and says that, uh, you know, that this project was not completed well and you wake up in the middle of the night last that night and you have yourself as a bag lady. Because mm-hmm. you're going to get fired tomorrow, you're gonna, you're gonna not going to be able to pay your mortgage. And you're, that's the spirit. It struggles with most everything. Mm-hmm. And it's always trying to get what it wants 
and get away from what it doesn't want. We are not this storyteller. We are that which can see it. We are that which in the middle of the night can say, oh, the scared one is here rather than, oh, my God, I'm going to be a bag lady. <laughs> and it's all about shifting and changing that mindset, right? Exactly. But, you know, the, it, it's, it, that can be helpful to shift and change your mindset. But really, truly, we, that, that is not where the lasting healing will be. The lasting healing will be discover that you can be with these different stories and they calm down all on their own and your natural state of aliveness, of adventure, of joy, that naturally arises. We don't need to try to get there. Mm -hmm. That's already here. It's just covered over by this struggling self. Right. Awesome. Okay, so share with us now. Fear is nothing to be afraid of. I love to hear people I know. talk about this. It's just, it's great. <laughs> you know, I say that to people that are not involved in this work, and they go, what? I know. Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've heard the acronym for fear, have you not? F-E-A-R, fake yeah. evidence appearing is real. Yeah. But we absorbed fear from our parents, and they absorbed it from their parents. The first spell in life, of the eight spells that I talk about in this book is I am separate from life. We're not. We are all integrated and integral parts of this great dynamic creative flow called life. But we separate out by getting lost in this storyteller. And then the second spell is life is not safe. And then you go into the three operating spells of now I've got to be in charge. I got to do it and I got to do it right. And I'm not doing it right enough. So this whole, the second spell is such an important one to begin to explore, to realize that yes, fear is uh, uh, a very essential part of being alive. It's a protector, but 99% of our fear is just psychological fear. It's stories in your head that can add one and one together and make up 22. Mm -hmm. So a good example for me is that I lived in dread. That's part of the reason why I was so compulsive and tried to kill myself. If you spend any time in dread, it's this horrible feeling that something really bad is going to happen and it's this dropping sensation, like being in an elevator shaft that is endlessly going down and coupled with the feeling that this bad thing is going to happen because I did something wrong. And so dread is my main form of fear. Mm -hmm. And I try to numb it. I try to get rid of it. I try to understand it. I try to analyze it. I try to think positive thoughts. But it wasn't until I began to become curious about dread itself. And, of course, I had to strengthen the muscle of my curiosity you know, enough so that I actually could go towards that feeling that I had run away from my whole life. And as soon as I could be with it, because remember, these states, these spells are nothing to be afraid of, although we have been trained to run away from them, and it's like, running away from the bear in the woods. Mm -hmm. You actually empower these spells. Mm -hmm. And so as you learn how to go towards in a very safe way, and you begin to explore it, you begin to dissolve this fake evidence appearing as real. Mm -hmm. It's just bound up energy. And when I could finally stand with my dread, it opened up into this deep, trust of mm -hmm. very interesting and yes most of society have, lives in dread yes so much yes wow. yes so share with us the power of curiosity yeah. and compassion well this is what we're talking about here is that I knew they were similar. <laughs> That's why I had to look at it again to make sure we weren't covering it. <laughs> yeah, but but it, it it's so 
it's so important to realize how curious a child is. They're just fascinated with what is going on. Then, then they get wounded and they start holding their breath and they run away to their head and now they're in the human doing rather than a human being. Mm -hmm. And curiosity gets dimmed by this, I gotta do it, I gotta do it right and I'm not doing it right enough. Mm -hmm. So, so much of this work is waking up that curiosity. It's like when I lead a retreat, I lead them in beautiful places like Costa Rica and Hawaii so that we can have this invitation to open back up into life. And I'll do things with movement and I'll do things with eating and I'll, I'll do things with, with uh, walking and listening that begin to waken up your curiosity about what is right now. So most people begin by just, oh my God, I'm going to be with my morning cup of coffee. And they see that most of the time they're not there. Mm -hmm. But then you get curious about how you go away. And more and more you get to know this struggling self that allows you to come back and be here for this amazing adventure of life. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the first quality of consciousness. The second quality of consciousness is the heart. And science has now shown that the heart is our main brain. And I'm not talking about mushy, ooh, I love you, I love you. I'm talking about the intelligence of this main brain. It wasn't safe to keep it online when we were young. So we have gotten lost in this struggling self that's trying to do life. As we begin to breathe in and out of our heart, tap our heart, you know, uh, pat our heart, as we begin to bring our attention to this area, we begin to wake up the vast healing of this heart. Mm -hmm. It's compassion. It's mercy. It's spaciousness. It is, this head is all about liking, disliking, good, bad, right, wrong. This brain includes everything. And it was that dread that needed not only my curiosity, but my kindness, mm -hmm. my compassion. And now it is very quiet inside of me. If something really major happens in my life, it does wake up, but I know how to be with it, and it calms right down again. Which is awesome. That's, that's curiosity and compassion. I want yeah. to just add one other thing, breath. And I, I do breath, I think, in all of my books because we are being breathed by life. Mm -hmm. And we held our breath in order to survive when we were young. And one of the greatest gifts you can give is to yourself and life is to open your breath back up again. Mm -hmm. That was one of the questions can, um, about breathing uh, it back into your life. So, right. yeah. Did you want to talk a little more about that? Well, the first thing that you can notice when you begin to become curious is you hold your breath most all the time. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And I used to do the breath class at the local hospital for years. And I would, these people that know nothing about awakening or something would come in and I would connect them to the breath and, and maybe the ah breath, which you just extend your out breath and you say ah. Mm -hmm. And that is the great sound of letting go, but it is also the sound of the heart. And we would just do the awe breath for three or four minutes. And then I would say, now open your eyes and tell me, you know, uh, how is thing, things different? Oh, my God. I just feel so much calmer. Mm -hmm. It is magical. Uh, you know, so much so that I did a two CD set on that class because we need to know that we have one of the most powerful healers that is available. And it's not another doctor, not an herb, not a, a pill, not, a, you know, whatever. It's learning how to connect with our breath again and gently, with great tenderness, open it back up again. And this heals you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Breath is so amazing to do breath exercises several times a day and things like that to ground us to remind us you know when we're when we're exercising we have to be consciously aware 
to breathe because we start to limit our breathing. You, you, you said that when we first started this section about how many times, you know, and I was thinking as you were talking, how many times do we stop breathing? We stop breathing when we're fearful. We stop breathing when we're excited. We stop breathing when we exercise. We stop breathing sometimes when we sleep. I mean, ridiculous, you know, yes. things. We, we need to be in, in this constant amazing flow. We even stop breathing when we make love. And that's the exciting part. <laughs> yeah, catch people. If you learn how to breathe with your partner before you make love, yeah. and then breathe through, oh my God, things open up. Mm -hmm. So, and it's yeah. not just making love; it's in all areas of our lives. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. Okay, so let's talk about you. You talked about the heart, but let's talk about the heart and how it can heal us. Well, it it. Uh, Heart Math it, it, down in California is doing amazing, amazing things about really recognizing how this is the main brain. We have three brains. We have the head brain, we have the heart brain, and we have the belly brain. And these two brains, the belly and the heart brain, were turned off a long time ago. You know, and mainly we did that by holding our breath mm -hmm. and just tightening, just tightening. Whereas our natural state is free-flowing aliveness. What we do is that we become a pale imitation of ourselves. We decide this part is not okay, and we stash it inside, and we decide this part is not okay, and that part is not okay, and then we're up in our head trying to be what we think we should be mm -hmm. because we have lost connection with ourselves. Every single part of ourself longs to be touched by our own heart. It longs for the acceptance of the heart, the inclusion of the heart. And it's just like you and I. If you're having a bad day and you go to a friend and you start sharing what's going on and that friend goes, oh, Mia, not again. Or, oh, Mia, I don't have time for you. Or, oh, Mia, I'm not going to put up with this and they walk out. How does that make you feel? Shuts you down. Shuts you down. Now imagine you go to a friend that just listens, doesn't even say anything, mm -hmm. but you can feel is right there. Mm -hmm. that, that heart, that acceptance of where you are is there. And you talk for 15 minutes and you feel better. They didn't even say anything. Mm -hmm. That is because you received the energy of the aware heart all the parts of ourselves and believe you me i put i think every single part of myself out of my heart and uh and so it's been a process to discover who is here what part is here whether it's the i'm not enough or it's the angry part or it's the arrogant part or it's the selfish part or it's the lost part or the confused part or the helpless hopeless despair part all those parts our whole life have been alone inside of us and they long to be listened to just like we do with our friend mm -hmm. and it's healing it it the way i like to describe it is we were free flowing aliveness when we were young we bound up all of this stuff and ran away to our heads and now we're learning how to use our attention to open up what has been closed mm -hmm. so that life can now dance through us. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you're going to be happy all the time. It just means that you can show up with what life is offering you without tightening down around it. Or if you do, because it takes a while to get to that really open place, if you do, you're fascinated by it. You know that life is showing you something. Mm -hmm. So I love to say that the challenges in your life are for you. What's in the way is the way. The mm -hmm. challenges are not here because you've done something wrong, God is punishing, or you fall asleep on the job. They are here to show you, and this is the, the last part of the book about how we can trust this living process, that life is giving you the exact set of experiences you need in order to bring into consciousness, into the aware heart, all the disowned parts of yourself 
so you can be fully and fully alive again. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Now, before we hop on to your free gift, which was really cool when you shared it with me, I'd like you to share with us, um, because we're almost out of time, I'd like you to share with us your books and then basically, you know, like give the title and then share a little piece that you just love so much about each one so that everyone understands yes. the yumminess of them. Oh, the first is Belonging to Life. Mm. And it's called, the subtitle is The Journey of Awakening. It was the first book that came pouring through me and I wrote it when my kids were growing up and I would do this in the middle of the night because it was just pulled me. And in there, I think my two favorite chapters is there's a chapter on fear in that one, too. Because oh. Fear is so much of what makes this happen. Yes. And there's a chapter on judger. Now, remember, I, I really, my judger went to law school and graduated top of the law class and was president of the debate club. And now the judger has no influence over me. So in that book is a, a, that wonderful chapter that really uh, uh, invites you to heal the judger by learning how to be with it rather than being lost in it. Awesome. That's and then the next book, The Gift of Our Compulsions, when I self-published it before the publisher picked it up, I called it Healing and Being Healed mm. by Our Compulsion. I love that title. Now remember, I am really, truly one of the was one of the most compulsive people I've ever met, and then my compulsion became my ally. Mm. It became not my enemy, but it became my teacher. Mm -hmm. I would not survive without my ability to numb myself because I took on so much pain mm -hmm. to numb myself through alcohol, drugs, and food. The alcohol and drugs faded away. Then the food became my teacher, or whenever it was there, it was showing me that there's something that needed my attention. Mm -hmm. And so that book is how to use your compulsions as a guide back home. And it completely changes your relationship to them and shows you that trying to control them, which is the main method that we use, mm -hmm. it doesn't work. And the statistics prove that out. That's awesome. Yeah, That's, I love that. And the third book is, and this came as I was sitting uh, in a long, uh, Mary Sue, the woman that, uh, uh, she's my business partner. She and I go away every year for a week and go into silence. And I was just sitting there in silence and all of a sudden, the fairy tale started coming. <laughs> and it's called The Magical Forest of Aliveness. And it's a little small book. And I meant it as a fairy tale for adults, but many people have read it to their children. And it really is our story. It's the story that we were all born in the magical forest of aliveness. And we all got caught in the village called Lyme. And what happens inside of the village mm. and how you begin to be able to see all this, recognize the magical forest again, go out into the magical forest and see the truth of light and love mm. and then bring it back to the um, uh, village. I, I, I just absolutely love that book. It's just, you know, very, very close to my heart. That's lovely. And then, of course, what's in the way is the way it came. And people yeah. say, you're going to write another book. I have no idea. Life has <laughs> not said to me, uh, time to write another book. But if it does, I will. Because yeah. that, that's my job is to, you know, I'm just the, the scribe. And if it says write another book, I will. Awesome. Well, we look forward to all of them. Can you share with us your free gift? I had made these wonderful cards. Now, what we've been talking about is unconsciousness and consciousness here. Unconsciousness is struggle. It's fixing, changing, rearranging, liking, disliking, judging, analyzing, trying to figure out, trying to get away from. Consciousness is curiosity about what is. Compassion or spaciousness. Mm -hmm. And then this open breath. So I had three cards made. The first is a question mark to remind you to be curious. And people can put it around their house. Mm -hmm. The second is a beautiful heart. They have wonderful backgrounds. And this is to remind you. And you can, you know, put one in your purse and put one on your bed. I had a question mark on the ceiling above my bed for years mm -hmm. because that reminded me in the morning 
rather than to slip into this struggling self to be curious about what is. And this third was made by a friend of mine, and it says, soft belly. Mm -hmm. Because it reminds us to soften the belly, allow the breath to open again, Mm -hmm. and that it really, truly is safe to open to life again. That's lovely. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Would you like to leave us with one last piece of yumminess? Well, the last chapter in the What's in the Way is the Way is called The Song of the Heart. And just even when I think about it, my heart just soars. And I just invite people to come sit on the moon with me for a second because I have these wonderful Lazy Boy recliners up there and all that. And you look across and you see the exquisiteness of our home. And you look at Mars, and it's red and rock and beautiful its own right. And you look at the moon, brown and dust. Oh, my God, you look at the earth. Jaguars, uh, icebergs, uh, mm-hmm. spinner dolphins, uh, jungles full of, of colorful parents, little uh, parrots, little tiny itty-bitty wildflowers in every single color you could imagine. It is such an exquisitely magnificent creation. And then you see that most people walk around with clouds around them. You can see that from the moon. Mm -hmm. And so to me, one of the most, most, most powerful things that we can do for the healing of this very beleaguered planet right now is to heal the war inside of us. And that's what all of my books are about. And as you're sitting there and you see more and more people thinning their cloud banks, so now... They can be here, whether it's for the absolute exquisite creation of your sandwich, which it took the whole universe in order to make that sandwich, or it's with the grocery store clerk, that you're actually there with them, or you are with heartache. Let's say your beloved pet just died, Mm -hmm. and you are actually with the heartache. All of that clears the cloud down. And I believe personally, I personally, this world will be here. Wonderful. That's lovely. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And these were wonderful, um, wonderful 30 minutes we spent together. And I so appreciate you coming on the show. I was so glad to be here, Mia. Thank you. And thank you all for watching and listening. And we'll see you in another segment. Bye.